Hi, I'm John McElroy. We're at Infineon's Detroit area offices. I'm sitting here with Bill Stewart. He's the Senior Director of Vehicle Automation and Chassis at Infineon. Thank and Bill, you. I know uh, a couple of things that are big for Infineon right now are decarbonization and digitalization in the mm -hmm. automotive arena. Yeah. Infineon, of course, being probably the largest chip supplier to the automotive industry in the world. Mm -hmm. How do chips play a role in decarbonization? Yeah, well, there's a lot of different ways. One is if we look at autonomous vehicles, um, we believe one, autonomous vehicles will be electric vehicles when they actually are fully deployed. So obviously there's a CO2 reduction there. The other side of it is autonomous features will ultimately be more efficient than you and I as gas engine drivers. Give us some examples. So if you think about congestion reduction, Right? If people are able to more efficiently plan their routes, plan where they're going to go, um, my car will automatically avoid traffic. Right, My car will automatically pick a route that maybe doesn't have a big hill. Um, there's different things which basically ultimately will use less energy as the vehicle is driving. Also, if I'm a consumer and I'm just a passenger in a car, I'm not as concerned about acceleration performance, right? I can put my car into more eco mode and I'm gonna want a smoother ride as opposed to a more fun ride where I'm racing down 696. So. I think that's a great point that EVs are probably going to push design changes for softer suspensions, mm -hmm. easier acceleration and braking and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah, the other thing they're pushing for is, you know, when you have an EV, you have these electric chassis, right? And you have a lot of legacy technology with mechanical systems, whether it's braking systems or steering systems. And what we're also seeing the trend is to electrify those systems as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do I ensure if I go to a steer by wire or a brake by wire system, you have the same level of safety and reliability and security that's in a uh, mechanical system. And that's something that we're helping to try to build both our customers' trust and in the end, consumers' trust. One of the big things we look at when you make that conversion is functional safety. And functional safety is really what is the likelihood a negative event or failure could occur, occur and then also what is the impact, right? So if it's just you have to turn an engine light on, Obviously, we don't want those types of failures, but that's not a horrible failure. Having your brakes fail and you run through a traffic light, that's a very high impact item. So what we are doing is putting the mechanisms into our chips and working with our customers in terms of how to design a system so that the likelihood of these failures is much less than the mechanical systems where you could have a hydraulic leak or you could have a, um, you know, even a tire blowout, right? Those types of things you don't want. There's got to be other advantages, too, of going to a by-wire system, mm -hmm. getting rid of the hydraulics. Talk a little bit about that in terms of complexity, weight, mm -hmm. cost, and all. Yeah, in terms of overall system complexity, this is part of what's driving some of the OEM architecture decisions, right? Moving to a central compute where you're making high-level decisions, having more integrated decisions between your propulsion systems and your chassis systems and your autonomous systems, if they know what each other is planning to do, you can make more intelligent decisions and more efficient decisions. Um, also, those hydraulic mechanical systems are very heavy, right? Um, you think about the hydraulic fluid, the motors, um, those are not light items. And when we talk about EVs particularly, weight plays a big role in terms of the range of the vehicle. So if we can lighten those systems by moving to the electronic versions, um, you also get an efficiency gain in that way as well. Wow, any idea what kind of weight you can save going to a bywire system? We, we've done some studies. It's, it's very vehicle by vehicle dependent. Um, you know, your big SUVs and uh, heavy duty trucks, it's more than it is in a, a light passenger car, but it's, uh, there is savings. It's very dependent on the type of vehicle. I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts too on how do you make the public comfortable mm -hmm. with going away from mechanical connections to the brakes and mechanical connection to the steering. Yeah. Well, the first we have to get just the, the OEMs comfortable, right? <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's obviously a lot of legacy uh, mindset, not, not just mindset, but just these systems work, right? We all get in our cars today and we just believe the brakes are going to work. Uh, yeah. Right? Uh, we, we don't Hydraulics worry have it. been around 100 <clears throat> years. Right. Um, but with any change in the industry, there there's 
you know, we have to prove it out. We have to prove it. And so, you know, when you look at what we do is we look at what is the likelihood of a failure to occur. So if our chip fails, if you have a communication failure, um, even, you know, one of the things is how do you detect those failures? Right? We can put mechanisms in the silicon to detect failures, hmm. um, whether it be some sort of memory corruption, whether it be a, a sensor. We also are implementing redundant systems. Right? I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. Don't you need like yeah. dual systems? Well, and, that, and that's where it becomes what is the impact, right? If one system fails, if you have redundant systems, um, then you have another backup system, which buys you time. Right? You don't want to drive indefinitely on the backup system, just like you don't want to drive indefinitely on the spare tire in your trunk. Um, but you may have 50 miles um, before you can drive it. You get it to a service center, your light comes on. Or some of these systems can actually diagnose and fix the issue. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you have um, a memory corruption, for example, there's mechanisms to detect that as it happens and then go through and reprogram the device to fix it. And that's where things like software over the updates and even some of the predictive maintenance algorithms, by having more electronic data, you're able to make these decisions quicker um, and potentially before a failure occurs. So, Going back to uh, autonomous vehicles for mm -hmm. a moment, um, you had mentioned, and I agree with this, that they'll lead to less congestion. Mm -hmm. But there's also the belief mm -hmm. out there that Look, if you make transportation easier and cheaper for everybody, more mm -hmm. people are going to be using it and we'll have more congestion. Yes. Uh, explain how you think there's going to be less. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a variety of market studies that we've looked at. Um, I know the University of Michigan released one which adds up all the different factors. And in the end, you come to a net reduction, right? And ultimately, there are factors which will increase traffic. It increases mobility. Uh, but ultimately, that's a good thing. Right? We have more people that may not have access to travel today or may need a different mechanism to get to work um, you know, or get their kids to school. We want to enable that. Mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's a positive side. Um, in the end, though, the net view is down. Right? And that's where it comes into more economic travel methods, even the right sizing of vehicles. Right? If I'm just a passenger car in a vehicle um, or a passenger in a vehicle, I don't need to necessarily be in my big SUV or my big truck if I'm just getting back and forth to school. I think if any of us take a, um, you know, a, an Uber or a Lyft today, you, know, you have to pay more to take the bigger car, right? So those become decisions that we're going to have to make. You know, do I want the bigger car or not on a case-by-case -case basis, which again, you know, if you reduce the size of the vehicles or you even do ride sharing where you have people sharing a car, um, you know, that is another way to ultimately reduce congestion. Yeah, so. great, great points there. Uh, very impressive, you know, Infineon making chips, but heavily into helping the auto industry decarbonize and digitalize, mm -hmm. you know, different components that have been mechanical for, as I said, over a century, really. Right. So. Bill, thanks so much for your time. Very interesting. Thanks, John. Good to talk to you.